Dobry wieczór Państwu. Good evening. Uh, I'm very glad to welcome you here in Ujazdowski Castle. I'd like uh, especially to welcome our distinguished guest, Mr. Manik Govinda. Uh, let me introduce firstly our, our guest. Uh, Mr. Manik Govinda is a writer and cultural commentator, freelance art consultant, mentor, co-founder of Artists for Brexit. He has appeared on Sky News, Russia Today, and BBC Radio 4, and writes on diversity, freedom of expression, and censorship in the arts. Mr. Manik Govinda was formerly uh, program director for Space and previously headed Arts Admin's Innovative Artist Development Program for 18 years, which led to producing film and video installation by internationally acclaimed artists. Uh, he also worked as an art curator, curator of debates, talks and shows on contemporary themes of identity, belonging, freedom of speech and Brexit. Uh, today, this evening, Mr. Mani Govinda uh, are going to talk about the phenomenon of cancel culture in the West. This is the topic of his lecture. Uh, but before giving the floor to Mr. Mani Govinda, let me just say a few words uh, as an introduction to this, to this lecture. Uh, I'll start with uh, some observation, um, the information about today's uh, lecture uh, caused a lively reaction in the internet. Various comments appeared on the Facebook and, uh, and fa on Facebook profile and Twitter. And I found one comment especially interesting. Uh, the author of the comment, of this comment, points out that the real problem in Poland now is not a cancel culture, but rather more traditional kind of censorship. Uh, in his opinion, uh, artists who use religious symbols um, in Poland in a wrong, inappropriate way are persecuted by courts. And uh, the second observation, that people who use symbols such as the LGBT flag uh, in the public sphere are discriminated. And he concludes that this is more dangerous for freedom of speech, this phenomenon, than cancel culture. And I'd like, firstly, to, to answer this objection uh, to, to, to this comment. Uh, and I agree, that's true, that there have been a few cases of suing artists for the iconoclastic use of religious, or blasphemous even, uh, use of religious symbols in Poland. But what is important, that no artist or no activist had been finally sentenced. Uh, moreover, this accusation uh, did not seriously, uh, in negative way, affect their career. Uh, for example, Dorota Niznalska, um, her case is the most famous in Poland, uh, now is active as an artist, uh, and she takes part in uh, a lot of important exhibition in, in, uh, in um, public uh, art institutions, and nobody erased her name from public sphere and from artwork. I agree that this is not, of course, this accusation are not something nice, uh, and that uh, such a temptation of traditional, I think, religiously motivated, censorship is still present. But in my opinion, this is not a real threat to freedom of speech in Poland. It's, it's like, I, uh, I, I could say, it's like a toothless predator. Um, and the second uh, thing, uh, the using of LGBT symbols, and this is not forbidden in Poland to, uh, to use such a symbols in the public sphere, and there, is no, there are no legal consequences for this. But, on the other hand, there are several cases of people who lost their jobs or encountered some serious legal consequences for criticizing the demands of LGBT communities. Uh, and this new censorship phenomenon has, it, has its roots in developed Western democracies, and Western democracies have been a model for our development and Polish development since transformation in 1989. Therefore, it's, this is my opinion, it's worth get, uh, it is worth getting to know the mechanism of this new so-called enlightened censorship because I think it will increase in Poland. 
And I hope, uh, Mr. Govinda, that your lecture will help us uh, to understand this, this new problem, this new kind of, of censorship. Mr. Manik Govinda, thank you again very much for coming uh, to us, and I give you a uh, floor. Well, thank you, Piotr, and thank you, everyone at the museum here. I've been welcomed with uh, extreme kindness and uh, uh, affection, so I, I really have my first visit to Warsaw, uh, my first visit to Poland, so uh, I will come again. It's such a beautiful city, and uh, I've really enjoyed my couple of days here. So, cancel culture in the West. I think we need to define what cancel culture is uh, because it's used so much on social media. So what does this term mean? As I said, we see hashtag cancel culture abundantly on social media platforms such as Twitter, Instagram or Facebook. So forgive me if you already know the meaning, but I think it's important that we define uh, the term. So cancel culture is also known as call out culture. It's a contemporary form of demanding that a person is removed or isolated from his or her profession or social network, or that an artifact, a work of art, for example, such as a book, a painting, a performance, a piece of music, a comedy show, film, that they are removed or shut down because a group of people finds the performance, sorry, find the person or the artwork to express or represent views that are seen as distasteful or offensive, and thereby harmful to the viewer, the spectator, the listener, or the public. I can write a very long list of individuals or artworks that have been cancelled or censored or called out for expressing views, showing imagery, or commenting on social media that some people find uncomfortable. And I just want to highlight a few very exa uh, recent examples that uh, only days ago we have had, particularly in Great Britain. So on Saturday, the 31st of October, I was on uh, Great Britain News, GB News, and I was commenting about a British Conservative Member of Parliament, a politician called Tobias Elwood, uh, who was calling for a series of sculptures by the bad boy art duos of British contemporary art, Jake and Demos Chapman. He, he urged the gallery uh, to remove these sculptures from the exhibition. The politician had a personal trauma behind his motive to urge the curator to remove the work as his brother was killed in a suicide bomb attack in Bali, Indonesia in 2002. It was a barbaric act by Al-Qaeda. It killed 204 innocent people and injured 209. And most of the victims were tourists. The Chapman brothers' work, as well as with most of their work, asks the viewer to consider war, death, heaven, hell. The title of the sculptures referenced the delusion in Islam that suicide bombers will be rewarded in the afterlife in paradise with bounteous pleasures and immortality. For the art specialist, the series is also a postmodern reference or tribute to Jeff Koons' 1985 artwork, Aqualung, which is a bronze sculpture of a breathing equipment for deep sea divers. So we have a vest that maintains life in Jeff Koons' work and a vest that brings death and destruction. Of course, the general public may not see the wider artistic, aesthetic context or concept it's a shocking piece, but it's made playful with a childlike application of paint on the hard bronze. Now, the politician's view, and I understand he didn't visit the gallery to see the work, said that the work was tasteless and insensitive. He said, and I quote, my brother was killed by a terrorist wearing one of these jackets. I strongly urge this insensitive exhibition to be removed immediately it is tasteless, offensive, and irresponsible, and I hope the exhibitors will act swiftly in taking it down. As the recent loss of a colleague in Parliament, Sir David Ames, um, I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk more about him in a minute, 
Uh, as the recent loss of a colleague in Parliament illustrates, the threat of extremism is very real, with individuals radicalised by, by what they see and read. Now, Elwood, the politician, is referring to the recent murder, I don't know if you know about this, um, the recent murder of an elected British Conservative politician, Dave, David Ames, who was stabbed multiple times on the 15th of October 2000, 2021. He was stabbed by a 25-year-old Somalian man, Ali Harbi Ali, who has now been charged with murder and the preparation of terrorist attacks, terrorist acts. So it's completely understandable to sympathize with the anger felt by a politician whose brother was killed in a terrorist act. And in light of the murder of a politician on the 15th of October, while he was fulfilling his democratic role of consulting his electorate, his constituency. But should this artwork by the Chapman brothers be censored or removed? I'll leave that for you to think about. Another case I'd like to highlight is the cancellation of the American artist, Philip Guston. He was due to have a ret retrospective at Tate Modern in London in February of this year. Setting aside the closure of all museums in the UK between December 2020 and May 21 due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the announcement of his postponement, of the postponement of Guston's show was made in September 2020. The exhibition was postponed due to issues with a series of paintings depicting the American Ku Klux Klan hooded figures. The reason given by the exhibition's American Partner Museum for the postponement was that the public is not properly able to read the work and will therefore have to wait, and I quote, they would therefore have to wait until a time at which we think that the powerful message of social and racial justice is at the, that is at the center of Philip Guston's work can be more clearly interpreted. In other words, the curators need to teach us how the works must be read at a later date when they deem it is politically more convenient. Now this decision was no doubt made in light of the protests by Black Lives Matter over the murder of George Floyd by an American police officer and the anger that this act triggered. A curator at Tate Modern called Mark Godfrey was suspended for work, was suspended from his job for speaking out against this cancellation on his personal Instagram account. He wrote on his Instagram post that it is extremely patronizing to viewers who it assumes not to be able to appreciate the nuance and politics of Guston's works. By canceling or delaying, a message is sent, out to the is sent out that the institutions understand or get Guston's clan paintings, but they do not trust their audiences. The curator has since accepted a voluntary redundancy. He no longer works at Tate Modern. The irony is that Guston, a committed anti-racist and a first-generation Jewish immigrant family who fled the pogroms in Russia, could potentially offend black people. It was deemed that Guston's depiction of the Ku Klux Klan was too irreverent, too clown-like, and too jokey for a Western audience in the USA and the United Kingdom to handle. It wasn't serious enough. Now, council culture is rife in both the UK and the USA, with both conservative and left-leaning cultural identity activists and lobbyists putting pressure on institutions to remove books, plays, or artworks from show or display. My knowledge of what's going on in continental Europe is limited, so my focus will be uh, very much about the United Kingdom. But we know that cancel culture is growing stronger for fear of offending minority interest groups. It's another George Guston piece with his uh, very jokey Ku Klux Klan smoking a cigar and painting a self-portrait. Um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful piece. It's, it, it displaces the aggression, and, um, but it does make an amazing commentary on, on American politics of that time. We must remember that it was 1968, it's when Martin Luther King was assassinated uh, and all kinds of other civil rights movements was um, flourishing in the USA. So, 
Moving on. In March 2019, accusations of racism were made by students at the Sorbonne in Paris against an adaptation of a classical Greek tragedy, The Suppliants, by Aeschylus. The protesters claimed that the, ad the adaptation was Afrophobic, colonialist, and racist. It was reported in the UK newspaper, The Guardian, that protesters picketed the prestigious Paris University, stopping the actors from entering the theater and accusing them of using blackface, that's blacking up, uh, of using blackface for the production. A photograph, this one, that was used to promote the play depicted one of the actresses in dark makeup but the theatre director insisted that none of the actors would be blacking up or using black uh, makeup for the actual performance. Instead, they would be wearing black and white masks in the tradition of ancient Greek theatrical aesthetics. But the protesters claimed that the university and the theatre production was engaging in colonialist propaganda. The theatre director, Philippe Brunet, insisted that the theatre was a place for metamorphosis, not a refuge of identities. The play, sadly, was forcibly cancelled by the protesters. Now, for me, cancel culture is not a theoretical thing that I'm just interested in when I collect incidents like this. Um, so I'm going to share with you my own personal experience of being cancelled by universities and cultural institutions. So my reason for having a very strong interest in this subject is that it's personal, it's real. So I worked in the arts for 14 years. Sorry, 34 years, not 14 years. I worked in the arts for 34 years. I was an immigrant from a working class background and I was the first to gain a degree in my family. Both my parents had left school at 14. I've always been interested by ideas, experimentation and the world of the imagination as expressed through the arts. Converging to curate work that asked audiences to question and to open new doors of understanding. I also believed that clashing ideas and traditions would create fresh thinking, looking at the world differently. My politics is an eclectic one, as I moved from a Marxist socialist position to a more libertarian position, but that also aligns with elements of the left and also a social democratic sensibility. The fundamental position that has underpinned all the work I've done as an arts professional is to push my finger at the status quo of cultural thinking and the politics in the arts. The arts organization I worked for for 19 years was an organization that aligned to my thinking. It was to encourage, develop and support artists to take risks and experiment, not just with form, but with their ideas and thinking. My passion for freedom of expression, artistic freedom, free speech, and debating ideas have always been at the center of my values. And I always thought that these values would be cherished in every liberal-minded liberal cultural institution. But this was not always so. Sadly, there are no-go areas in public debate. In my own experience, these were my disagreements uh, with the boycott of Israeli artists, for example, my critical position with regards to uh, art and environmentalism, my public support for leaving the European Union, and more recently, my questioning thoughts on tra transgenderism, specifically on gender self-identification and the silencing of people who are critical of this current wave of gender politics. I also have a sense of humor. I like to joke about things, and it is for these jokes that sometimes I express on my social media platforms, my own personal social media platforms, that have got me into trouble, into deep waters. It was the jokes that have mainly got me into trouble. Over the last three years, as an independent arts consultant and writer and mentor, I have been cancelled and called out on social media, and I have lost work as a result of being cancelled. My former employer, um, when I went for a trip to Israel uh, during my own personal time, in my own holiday time, 
I was invited to speak at a roundtable debate uh, on cultural boycotts. Um, I was called out by a pressure group that I was attending this, um, this conference, and uh, uh, the conference was in Tel Aviv, and it was reported, reported by a boycott campaign group on its blog, uh, and they sent this to my uh, employer, um, that I was expressing stridently anti-boycott views at uh, this uh, conference in Israel. So I was seen as a public embarrassment by my employer, and I was made to account for my decision to take part in this conference at uh, a staff meeting, at a public st at a staff meeting with all my colleagues there. In other words, I was made to feel like a naughty schoolboy being disciplined by the headmistress. After the national referendum to leave the European Union on the 23rd of June 2016, relationships between my employer and I had worsened. Both my employer and an arts organization that I was on the, uh, as a non-executive board member of were contacted by someone who saw that I had liked a posting made by a, a friend of mine on Facebook. Uh, it was a thread that I started criticizing the Scottish minister, Nicola Sturgeon's very staunch anti-Brexit position. The exchange led to the friend posting a visual joke. Maybe it was bad taste, uh, but I clicked the like button on Facebook. Now this led to an almighty angry exchange between artists expressing shock that I endorsed a sick image. I said that, the form, that this was a form of artistic or poetic license. Yes, I found it funny. It's my Facebook page after all, my personal page, and I feel that I can express myself in whatever way I want. I can be sometimes a bit crude and a little vulgar. So this time, my employer took things further, as it was a written complaint by an artist about my conduct on my own social media page. I decided to take legal advice, so I met my union representative for advice, and I believe my employers also took legal consultation with a lawyer. But as I was expressing myself in a personal capacity, I was not attacking the company I worked for, both my union representative and, I presume, the legal advisor that my employers consulted concluded that it was not grounds for a formal discipline or that they could sack me. However, again, I was reprimanded with warnings that the company would be drafting a social media policy to stop me from expressing myself publicly as it was causing damage to company reputation. More recently, since becoming a freelance in October 2018, I have been under attack by trans activists for another post I made on my social media page. This time I made a comical response after reading a piece in the Times newspaper that a lecturer and trans person was behind a concerted smear campaign against gender critical academics. Now, the author, Vladimir Nabokov, remarked once that nothing is more exhilarating than Philistine vulgarity. I think I agree with him. My social media language took inspiration from a number of my heroes. And one of them is uh, a punk um, icon, a punk, uh, 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 for me, uh, you know, uh, uh, an inspiration formerly known as Wayne County, but as a transsexual, changed um, his name to Jane County. So Jane County, um, she was banned from Facebook in 2014 for making derogatory transphobic comments on Facebook. I don't know if you want me to read that. Uh, I'm having a party tonight and all my breeder, fag, dyke, tranny, and shemale friends are invited. Trans rights activists complained about it, and she was banned from Facebook. Now, this pattern of cowardly, anonymous reporting of people for saying things in a personal capacity or on social media that is deemed something phobic, transphobic, Islamophobic, xenophobic, you name it, has increased to worrying levels since Jane County's social media ban in 2014. Some artists, writers, cultural critics have also been under verbal attack 
They've been lied about, they've been cancelled and censored by a growing generation of online Stasi-like informants. Lesser known people who are not as famous as Jane County, for example, uh, have been cancelled. Some of them are my friends and they've been cancelled um, from uh, employment. I can name some artists, do look them up. Um, there's the artist Nina Edge, who's of mixed race parentage. There's the cultural critic philosopher Nina Power, the visual artist Rachel Ara, the writer DC Miller, and a most innocent um, uh, Twitter page called Hashtag Women's Art, which puts up wonderful images of overlooked and uh, ignored women artists, um, was called out for being transphobic because it was only shown biological female artists. There's a writer, Dr. Gareth Roberts, who wrote uh, the, some of the Doctor Who scripts. He's been cancelled. And also um, uh, a former director who was very much in, involved in the kind of queer arts movement. Uh, he was director for uh, a, a festival in north of England, in Manchester, called Queer Up North. His name is Jonathan Best, or Johnny Best. So what happened to me? Someone screen grabbed my Facebook comment and circulated it on Twitter. So what I thought, they're entitled to their free speech. I'm entitled to argue back, which I did. However, the situation worsened when an anonymous Twitter group called TERFs Out of Arts. Now, TERFs is seen as a very derogatory term. It means trans-exclusionary radical feminists. Radical feminists who are seen to be gender critical, gender free, um, who make comment, who, who will have an intellectual critical engagement about um, transgenderism. Now these people were hunted down by this anonymous Twitter group, Turf Sounds of the Arts, um, and they started to inform their clients, their hosts, their employers, their contractors uh, of, some, uh, of something they may have said on, on social media or about the work they produced or a piece of writing, accusing them of transphobia. Now, I was targeted and I was subsequently dropped in England by galleries. Um, I was dropped by a, a gallery in Nottingham um, where I was a judge for an open call exhibition. I was cancelled as an artist mentor by the University of the Arts London where I mentored a lot of uh, undergraduate and recent early career artists. I was cancelled by Bloomberg New Contemporaries and I was cancelled by uh, an, an arts organisation called ArtQuest. I was cancelled as a chairperson and facilitator by a gallery in Brighton called The Lighthouse, where I was due to give a facilitate an artist talk. And that was all because of one comment that I made on my, first, my personal Facebook page. Now I know who some of the informants are. One of them are a young arts collective who I gave a free mentoring session to, to, uh, to them. So much for kindness and goodwill. Another are uh, a pair of young visual arts bloggers called The White Pube, who attacked me for defending an artist uh, called Nina Edge. Um, and another is a woman who I worked with, who I regarded as a professional colleague when I worked on a disability arts project with her. Now, this online witch, witch hunt is particularly um, damaging to people who rely on freelance or contractual work. Individuals who have no employment rights are hit hardest. People's livelihoods are being affected, not because of the quality of their work and what they do, but for holding views or political positions that go against the grain of our current dominant cultural politics. The irony is that dissident voices against mainstream cultural thinking in the arts have much more resonance with the majority of citizens, the public. The 2019 general election in the United Kingdom was very much like a second referendum as the parties, between, as the parties battled between whether to remain or to leave the EU. A Conservative government won and the UK left the European Union on the 31st of January 2020. On the gender issue, there was a public consultation on the proposed reform of the Gender Recognition Act 2004. 
on whether to revise the Act to include gender self-identification. Now, this hasn't been resolved, and the debate continues to remain fiery and complex. These are major public issues that are fiercely debated in public space, um, whether that is online or in real space. But the arts institutions will only allow one side of the argument to be expressed. However, I think there is hope. I don't want to be too skeptical or cynical. There are new groups opening up everywhere where antithetical voices are being heard and supported. It's very underground, it's not public. So for example, as a result of the referendum, I co-founded Artists for Brexit and more recently Brexit Creators. Yes, even Brexiteers have differences and I left the former group. He was too much of a Stalinist in my opinion. Um, social media witch hunts are leading to greater self-censorship and to counteract these censorious tactics, secret meetup groups are developing everywhere where free speech, freedom of association and free thinking are positively encouraged, offering intellectual as well as moral support. However, the public arts institutions are behaving in a cowardly manner, treating critical voices as lepers or pariahs to be silenced, rendered invisible, as if we're a dangerous viral infection. Neither I nor any of the people I mentioned have been cancelled because they pose a threat to staff, to students, to fellow artists or to visitors. Yet, we're perceived to be a danger. So, I'll quote from Brighton Lighthouse, who cancelled me, and they emailed me, stating that a recent comment I made on Twitter refers to a trans activist in a derogatory manner. This comment directly opposes our organisational values and code of conduct, as well as our equal opportunities and bullying and harassment policies. Lighthouse is committed to providing a happy and supportive environment for our staff and audiences. Volunteers and contributors to our programme and all other activities are expected to share this commitment. For that reason, we are not able to have you lead the conversation tomorrow evening at a public-facing event. University, University of the Arts London responded to my controversy surrounding comments I made on my social media page that the remarks refer to a person's gender identity and may be perceived, and may be perceived as offensive derogatory and humiliating, whether they relate to an individual or a group. Such remarks do not reflect the values of the university. I was advised to seek out a way that could ameliorate the situation, possibly by affording an apology to those affected by my remarks. It was very hard, it was very tough. I was losing work, I, was, uh, uh, I need to earn money, I'm not rich. <laughs> But after much thought, I decided that I would not apologize for a comment that I made in response to a witch hunt against gender critical women, lesbians, gay artists and writers. Arts institutions and universities should be free spaces, or should be spaces rather, where free and open debate from all persuasions should be allowed. Organizations should not punish individuals for opinions expressed on their personal social media platforms that's within the law. Racial hatred or incitement to racial attack and violence is a different thing. Um, but all of our expressions are made within the law. Institutions, in my opinion, should uphold the liberal democratic values of free speech and expression for all, even speech and expressions that are disagreeable. Restricting speech you disagree with leads to a dangerous path of Sorry, this is uh, Jane County's response to um, her attackers on social media. Um, uh, and she said, I cannot support trans activist suppression of free speech, even threatening newspapers not to print alternative viewpoints. I have read about such things in Nazi Germany in the 30s, but never would I have ever dreamed that it would come from my own people. The right to take away another human being's rights what a sad day this is for the poor LGBT community. All over the few words that have been made even more powerful and evil by those that seek to erase them. If this is what you are doing with your own rights, then you don't deserve to have them. I no longer support trans rights. I do not support fascism from anyone. You have lost Jane County as a supporter. 
you are now the enemy. Everyone, please make a copy of this and keep it and put it on your walls, as this will probably be censored. I will be banned again for not agreeing with trans activists who seek out all those who disagree with them. Sincerely, Jane slash Wayne County. And I think it's really telling when trans, gen, uh, trans women, trans men, are actually finding the whole situation really worrying because uh, it's, it's religious-like um, uh, approach to shutting down and excommunicating people. So, I think restricting speech that you disagree with leads to a dangerous path of suppression and expulsion for everyone, regardless of whether you are left-wing or right-wing. But why is there such cowardice from the cultural institutions in the West who seem to want to appease the mobs of minority protesters who do not represent the sensible majority? It seems that aside from a few, very few exceptions, cultural institutions have lost sight of what the original values that they should be standing for. So what are those values that I think institutions, galleries, museums, um, art centres should be uh, standing for. I'm going to go back to the Second World War. And the British government at that time set up a, an amazing organisation called the Committee for Encouragement of Music and the Arts, CEMA, CEMA. Uh, it was set up to organise artistic and cultural activities for the majority of the British population. The famous and influential economist, John Maynard Keynes, was Seema's first and only chairman, and he played a major role in drafting the charter of the body that would eventually become the Arts Council, which is our major public-funded body for the arts in England. It was then the United Kingdom. In an essay for the Listener magazine in 1945, which was called the Arts Council, its policy and hopes, Keynes explained his approach, and I quote, the task of an official body is not to teach or to censor, but to give courage, confidence, and opportunity. Artists depend on the world they live in, and they depend on the spirit of the age. There is no reason to suppose, to suppose that less native genius is born into the world in the ages empty of achievement than in those brief periods when nearly all we must value has been brought to birth. New work will spring up more abundantly in unexpected quarters and in unforeseen shapes when there is a universal opportunity with traditional and contemporary arts in their noblest forms. But do not think of the Arts Council as a schoolmaster. Your, your enjoyment will be our first aim. That was written in 1945, just after the war. Now, if we move forward to 2020, the Arts Council England, um, in their vision strategy, strategy document called Let's Create, have um, promised or committed that by 2030, we want England to be a country in which the creativity of each of us is valued and given the chance to flourish, and where every one of us has, a re has access to a remarkable range of high quality cultural experiences. Now, setting aside the poetic loss of language being replaced by this bland business, business culture speak, we also see a downward spiral as modern-day public, publicly funded bodies drop the words art and artist from their visions. Instead, they're prioritizing ideas like how everyone is creative and culture should be accessible to everybody. The, arts, the artist is placed into a banal, utilitarian role as a creative, a cultural provider or practitioner who gives the administrators what they want. Arts and cultural policy have been going this way for decades now. The current strategy from the Arts Council England explicitly advocates that all creative expression should be nurtured and developed, irrespective of quality. This notion of embedding and empowering creativity with a missionary zeal goes hand in hand with quantifiable outcomes that are meant to address historical imbalances with the promotion of, and I quote, environmental responsibility, inclusivity, and relevance that represents the diversity of this country. 
while they also support cultural leaders who will work in ways that are valuable to and valued by communities, creative practitioners and partners. In other words, they seem to be enslaved to a much wider body politic. Now, the idea of the artist here is that of uh, some kind of community leader or educator who is embedded within institutions and whose role is to pass on the cultural establishment's favoured messaging. In Keynes's terms, Arts Council England has become a schoolmaster, with the school prefects running its funded institutions. They are able to cancel and censor critical voices that question or don't fit into the current political activist zeitgeist. In publicly funded cultural institutions, censorship, self-censorship, pedantic messaging and cancel culture have become rife. Cancel culture, spurred on by a, by a small but vocal minority of identity activists on social media, and endorsed by cultural leaders in many arts organizations, has attempted to silence writers and artists who question issues relating to race or gender identity. Meanwhile, other cultural institutions will turn a blind eye to the unjust witch hunt of these critical voices. I don't know if anyone's ever read Mark Fisher. Um, he's um, he's a, a very important um, cultural theorist. Um, I would say a Marxist on the left. And um, sadly, he committed suicide in January 2017. But he wrote a very important essay regarding the contemporary left, which he titled Exiting the Vampire Castle. And there, he, his essay compares the, uh, the identity-obsessed left to a new religion. So he says, the vampire's, the vampire's castle specializes in propagating guilt. It's driven by a priest's desire to excommunicate and condemn. An academic pedant's desire to be the first to be seen to spot a mistake, and a hipster's desire to be one of the in-crowd. The danger in attacking the vampire's castle is that it can look as if, and it will do everything it can to reinforce this thought, that it looks as if it is, that it looks as if that one is also attacking the struggles against racism, sexism, and heterosexism. But far from being the only legitimate expression of such struggles, the vampire's castle is best understood as a bourgeois liberal perversion and appropriation of energy of these movements. The vampire's castle was born the moment when the struggle not to be defined by identitarian categories became the quest to have identities recognized by a bourgeois big other. When he wrote this, he was hugely attacked by the usual um, uh, woke and social justice um, uh, activists. Um, and I'm sure that may have contributed to his depression. He had mental health issues. Um, which led to his unfortunate suicide. Um, but there, there's, there is comparisons. I think we can make uh, very strong um, parallels with um, the Puritanism of you know, two, three centuries ago um, with what's going on in the new Puritanism of um, contemporary cultural politics. Um, I'll quote another... Um, uh, sorry, that's my last one. Um, I'll quote another um, uh, professor um, who is of uh, black mixed parentage uh, origin. He's an American linguist and professor, and his name is John McWhorter. I highly recommend um, him, uh, for you, the audience, to, to look him up and, and read about him. He's got a new book that's just come out called Woke Racism, How a New Religion Has Betrayed Black America. And he also likens the progressive identitarian left to religion, creating a Salem-like situation of witch hunts driven by a sense of hysteria. It's the new Puritanism, and if you question this new Puritanism, you are automatically labeled a racist, a transphobe, or an alt-right. McWhorter said in an interview, there's been a vast overswing of the pendulum. We have this reign of terror where people are getting fired, people are pretending to agree with things, 
People are watching their children being miseducated in certain ways, all because everybody is afraid of being called a racist by Twitter. Sorry, being called a racist on Twitter by articulate, overeducated people. So let's not beat around the bush. Cancel culture is censorship. It silences opinions that doesn't fit in with the religion, the woke religion, as John McWhorter calls it. And therefore, in the eyes of these activists, it must be ostracized, excommunicated, or expunged. Now, the great orator, thinker, uh, an ex-African-American slave from the 19th century, Frederick Douglass, couldn't have put it much more clearly. To suppress free speech is a double wrong. It violates the rights of the hearer as well as those of the speaker. That was in the 18... 1860, where he was giving, um, he was invited by um, uh, the anti-slavery uh, movement to give a talk. It was um, closed down, uh, cancelled uh, by um, by the opposite, by um, pro-slavery um, uh, activists. But he said that this uh, this public debate should not be closed down, even though it was being attacked by uh, pro-slaverists, pro-slavers and that we do need to have this conversation and we need to convince those people even though they may not like what we say. And I would say that it's also the same in our contemporary culture. If you, I would quote, which is not attributed to Voltaire, but I will agree with you to the death. Um, you're right to say it, even if I hate what you say. So that's the end of my speech, uh, and I thank you for listening to me. And I would really like to hear what you all think uh, in terms of your own experience and in terms of your own um, um, points of view. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your very interesting lecture and uh, this uh, also this personal uh, part of the lecture. I think it, w it was very important and very I think it was, uh, yes. very important. So thank you very much. And uh, this is time for for uh, questions. Questions are welcomed uh, and welcome and uh, could be asked in Polish also. Dzień dobry. Dziękuję za wykład. A jestem jedną z osób, która w Polsce miała podobne doświadczenia. Prowadziłem, od 2010 prowadziłem duży profil na Facebooku. A, okej. Okay. Okej, okay. jeszcze raz. Try again. E, dziękuję za, za wykład. Mam podobne doświadczenie od 2010 roku, kiedy doprowadziłem na Facebooku duży profil zajmujący się krytycznym spojrzeniem na rzeczywistość. Satyryczny. To był profil satyryczny. To nie był profil, który określano później jako opel nienawiści. To po prostu była satyra. I coś się wydarzyło w 2015 takiego, że osoby, które publikowały na Facebooku polskim niepopularne opinie lub śmiały się wprost z opinii, a czy z rzeczywistości, która, która jest, no ujmę to tak, coraz głupsza. A, zaczęły być eliminowane stamtąd, to jest to, co opisałeś. To tak w skrócie, coś, coś co myślę jest ciekawe w, w Polsce, moim zdaniem, e, tylko mamy trochę inną sytuację, mamy trochę inną mentalność, inną kulturę, inne doświadczenia. I moim zdaniem wyróżniamy się spośród innych nacji tym, że mamy czarny humor i dowcip, który jest czytelny dla wszystkich. A te kwestie, które u was ciągle działają, czyli nazwanie kogoś faszystą, u nas często antysemitą,
zostało nas tak odwrócone przez społeczność ludzi, która po prostu się nie zgadza z tego typu określeniami. Bo zaczęli ci ludzie mówić, no tak, jestem faszystą, tak. Ja jestem antysemitą, faszystą, homofobem, tak. No, so what? <grym> A, I w, mam wrażenie, że w polskim internecie tego typu problemy, które wy ciągle macie, być może żyje w swojej bańce. E, nie działają. Ten sposób, który jest skopiowany od was, to na pewno... Mhm. Bo te strategie są skopiowane od was, jeden do jednego, tylko w, w przyłożeniu do polskiej kultury one nie działają i teraz myślę ratuje. Taka uwaga z mojej strony. A propos tego, w, ciekawa historia i powiem tak, jestem przerażony w jak w faszystowskich realiach funkcjonujecie. <grym> Przeprowadź się do Polski, tu jest wolność, naprawdę. <grym> Dziękuję. Swapping too many microphones. Um, no, thank you for sharing that. Uh, I think what I, uh, when I was on my guided tour today, um, it was just wonderful to see um, a square called Liberty um, Liberty Corner, I think, where free speech is allowed, and there's a wonderful abstract statue, um, which of a like a ramp um, uh, flying into the air. You know that there's endless possibilities. Uh, I, 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 I hope that you know this. Um, the influence of what's going on in the USA and also now in the U United Kingdom does not start to uh, 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 become replicated in, in, in Poland. Um, it's, it's so important whether one is mocking religion or one is mocking um, you know, contemporary uh, identity politics uh, that um, you know, it's, it, it is easy to satirize uh, uh, but also to satirize with complexity is really important. So uh, recently um, on Netflix, there's the um, African-American comedian Dave Chappelle. Yes, Dave Chappelle, for example, um, who um, he criticizes everything, the left and the right, um, various uh, um, manifestations of identities. And uh, there's recently been calls to um, take down his recent comedy, um, his recent a comedy performance that's on Netflix because it's seen as transphobic. Um, and, and there's a video uh, which I saw on, um, uh, on social media which really did remind me that it was almost like a fanatical religion um, where um, one protester had a placard saying, Dave Chappelle's a good guy. And then these other people um, took his placard down, uh, destroyed it and then accused him of having a weapon because his um, wooden pole was now an, a weapon <laughs> that they destroyed. And, uh, and then they kept telling him to repent, repent, repent. So it does become like a, a, a religion, um, you know, which is, you know, it has all the similar similarities to Salem and the hysteria that overtook um, Salem, Massachusetts. Um, uh, I know that you know Protestantism is of that time is was very very um, extreme and um, uh, so much um, uh, hysteria was built and I think we're having a similar situation. But I hope that Poland will be this bastion of free expression. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So uh, you said a lot, you said a lot in that speech, and uh, I'm trying to collect my thoughts over here. But it seems to me that censorship, we, we heard the phrase at the beginning, enlightened censorship, which to me is almost a contradiction in terms. To me, censorship is, a, is, a, is but a step away from the book burnings of Nazi Germany and the various other places that we've, that we, that we've seen that. And obviously, this is a complex issue, and it's probably one that you've, that you've thought about yourself and maybe you've discussed with some of your friends whom you mentioned have also been cancelled. What, in your view, is 
a good step or are some good steps that we could take to get back to having an active public debate instead of people shouting each other down, repent, <laughs> which is horrifying. Thank you. Yes, no, I, uh, how do we try and reclaim space to have conversations and, and debates? Um, I think, um, and I'm going to um, maybe just paraphrase um, a British philosopher Bertrand Russell, where he said um, about toleration, and um, you know he was an anarchist, and uh, you know he was a pacifist, and um, refused to fight in the war, and so forth. Um, uh, he um, he said that you know in order for toleration to happen, we need to start at schools, and start in education, and that we rather than indoctrinate young people, we need to kind of equip them with the art of debate and the art of uh, uh, argument. Argument in a civil context, not in a shouting someone down or walking out or feeling emotionally um, uh, um, hurt. Um, and it has to start in education. And I think if we can get the, the educational institutions to start, um, you know, particularly when people are starting to think about the world and the world that we live in, um, that, on one level, it's based on clear evidence. Um, so, if one talked about biology and sex, for example, that that Which is, is so a controversial fact. This. Um, and but there are people who are identifying in a different way from their biological sex. Now, let's think about what that debate is about, and we could look at both sides of the argument, and we can make our own decision on which we think is more convincing. Now, I, I, I think, and I do believe, that the majority of people um, are not um, extreme in the examples I've given. We need to get off social media a lot more, <laughs> and have kind of spaces like here, and uh, whether that's in a pub or in a social club, or in lecture halls, um, uh, or in informal meeting groups, um, we, we need to kind of start pushing out the, the, that critical debate is very important, and nothing is above or beyond debate, which is what I think um, activists um, will kind of say now, that you know, your censorship, uh, sorry, your free speech is hurting my, my, my position, my, my individuality, my expression. Um, we need to develop more thicker skins. Um, we need to become um, more courageous uh, on both sides to listen and to debate and talk about it. There may well be a, 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 a middle ground that can be found uh, a way through a way forward, and uh, and that's not to ignore all the you know uh, ills of um, uh, prejudice that does exist of. Um, uh, of racism or sexism or, 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 or transphobia in some parts of the world. It's very extreme. Brazil, for example. And, but to kind of say that everyone is transphobic is not the case. There are very specific extremes, I think, of transphobia, but no one talks about that. It's very much about everyone being... So if we can look at things in more detail, have a more contextual discussion about it, and I think it has to start in education. I couldn't agree more. Is that, can, can you guys hear me? Oh, yeah. There you go. Uh, so I couldn't uh, agree more. If I may, if I may uh, ask a follow-up. So uh, you mentioned education. Of course, um, absolutely, uh, absolutely essential. Um, got wrapped up in my own thoughts there. Mm. Give me a sec. But or if you or if you'd like to uh, like to continue. Okay. Um, so I have a question. First off, thank you for your presentation today. It offers um, a different point of view. So if we're not there with education yet to um, be open to hearing both sides, so where do we draw the line between free speech and what's harmful for society, especially for? societies that education is not the best and 
stereotypes are taking over. Um, so certain depictions for some minorities can be very harmful and um, like in encourage people to do some violent uh, activities towards the minorities. So where do we draw the line in that, in your opinion? Um, I suppose if we try and look at specific examples, um, so in Paris, um, 2015, Charlie Hebdo, um, which, if anything, is, a, is a, a very strong tradition of poking fun at religion and poking fun at uh, the, clerical, the clerics, whether that is in Islam or Catholicism. And um, what I think, if that was seen as uh, uh, someone described as uh, it's punching down uh, at, um, at communities that don't have much um, of a say in uh, in uh, equality, in social fairness, in justice. My, my, my uh, arguments against that position about that, you know, free speech, um, free speech absolutists are punching down uh, at people that don't have the, you know, the level of intellectual equipment or, um, uh, or thinking is, is, is actually, um, in my opinion, wrong. Because if we look at what's going on, and obviously my talk was very much about what's going on in the West, but if we look at what's going on in terms of the struggle and fight for free speech in other far more oppressive um, uh, 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 theocratic states, for example, you know, in the Middle East, Iran, um, uh, Saudi Arabia, um, uh, where you have, uh, or, or South Asia and Bangladesh, where bloggers are being murdered, you know, for for expressing views that are critical of religion, um, we are not standing side to side or in solidarity with those people. Um, and, for example, when the the the, the, the murders of uh, uh, the, the individuals involved in Charlie Hebdo uh, happens, you know, why, not all of them were white Protestant Europeans. Um, uh, one of them was an, uh, an Arab, uh, an Algerian Arab woman of Algerian descent, who was, um, uh, who was, who witnessed, who worked for Charlie Hebdo. I don't think she she was uh, she was in hiding when the attack happened, um, but she was married to one of the senior journalists of that of that magazine. Um, and I think you know we, we 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 if we want to look at the bigger global picture, we have to. Um, Remember what, what Frederick Douglass says, um, that you know, um, for, the, uh, for people that are in a minority of being oppressed um, um, uh, in various other parts of the world, free speech is, is a luxury. We have free speech, I hope we have free speech in the West that's enshrined in various kind of um, charters and enshrined in various um, uh, United Nations declarations and so forth. Um, but we, we mustn't forget that free speech and f uh, free expression is seriously under attack, uh, and the exhibition that, um, the political arts exhibition shows some of the work of, um, uh, of critical voices in the arts um, making a, a, a point of view or a, a work of arts that is critical of their own um, national regime. Uh, so. So I don't believe in this punching down thing because you know God is probably not the victim. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if anything, He is the higher authority. We're not punching down religion. We're punching up um, against religion. Uh, so we we have to kind of try and promote that plurality is really important. Plurality of opinions, viewpoints, plurality of um, diversity. Um, I certainly would not want to see. Um, um, left-wing Marxists um, silenced uh, in academia or in, 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 in cultural institutions, but I think there has to be a really good balance going on where um, one can have exhibitions that might have conversations with each other. Um, something that might be, um, you know, so for example, the, the, the exhibition here, the political arts one, Next door, there's an exhibition that is very pro-Palestine, uh, and that's really healthy. I think that there is uh, this kind of interesting kind of uh, conversation between, I think, the viewers 
around these you know, kind of very different um, curated, curated projects. Um, so I think anything short of, uh, obviously, the, you know, within the law, um, and, but you know, blasphemy was illegal once upon a time, and it still is illegal in many countries. Um, so r laws that are unjust, we have to fight against them. Um, and free speech is one of the only means to do that, through writing, through expressing yourself, through saying, I think, I believe, I think this is wrong. Uh, now, one, when one's attacking abstract notions of, let's say, religion or genderism, um, it's a different thing, where um, one's willfully putting out incorrect, um, incorrect stories, you know, is the earth flat? Does the, does the sun revolve around the, uh, the, the earth? You know, um, uh, th those are ridiculous statements and, you know, can easily be discounted through evidence. And, and I think having some kind of objective evidence, evidential approach to things is really important. I think anyone could believe what they want, um, uh, but it's when it's imposed on other people uh, that, or indoctrinated um, uh, in institutions that I start to worry about. So, so yes, free, free speech for all, even free speech that we disagree with or might hate um, uh, is really important. I hope that's answered your, your thoughts. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, <clears throat> my question was, um, well, it's a comment and a question. It's something missing from your presentation that I think is very important is the 1960s, the cultural revolution, the social revolutions that went on there. And there's two points I want to make about that. One is the old taboos on blasphemy or the taboos on talking about sex or mm -hmm. the taboos um, that existed prior to 1968, prior to the, the Great Revolution. And these taboos have now been replaced by taboos on race and gender and, well, what does it all have in common? A taboo on hate, trying to get rid of hatred from humanity. That's the element that, that seems to be interesting. The second thing is that after 1968, leftist movements change and we enter the post-Marxist left sort of period. And I was just wondering what you, you said that you once identified as a Marxist, or you, maybe not so much now, I'm not, I want to ask you that question, but you were comparing, you were talking about the Puritans, you were talking about the old religious kind of urges, but maybe you also, it would be worth thinking about comparing it with the extreme left of, of the Marxist period and their rather kind of um, religious style way of seeing the world and the extreme intolerance of any other visions that would not, mar would not match that. And what we're really looking at here is the overall threat of the extreme left, which in the West, for some reason, for historical reasons and cultural reasons, we appear to be blind to. We're all very well um, educated in the, in the West about the danger of the extreme right. Um, but perhaps what, what Poland has, what the advantage of Poland, is that it knows the dangers of both, of the, both extreme right and the extreme left. And that's why we find ourselves, from the point of view of Western people, in the paradoxical situation where um, Poland could be a beacon, uh, where we're going to have these kind of uh, discussions. I just pointed out that I was at an exhibition today in this building next door. Um, such an exhibit is impossible to imagine that being um, held in Glasgow or Edinburgh or London. I just can't even imagine it. So um, thank you for an interesting talk. C can I just add, add to that comment? As a, um, a post-1968 uh, leftist, <laughs> it's not quite how I um, remember, remember things. Yeah, sure, there was an extreme left. There was what we used to, we used to call ultra-leftists, the far left, yeah. But there was also a different left, which I was a member of. And, and, and one of our key kind of stances was in defense of free speech. I mean, the big debate in the 1970s was about no platform for, for fascists. And we argued on the left, yes, there should be platforms for fascists. So the way to defeat fascism was through open kind of uh, open debate. And that was a very quite difficult argument <laughs> to put in, uh, in the 1970s. But th so what I was connecting that to what you were saying, what, what you're, the situation you're describing, which I don't have a lot of direct experience of because I live in Ireland and it's, things are different there, is that 
yeah, one of the problems is the, the you know, you, you talked about the identitarian left, yeah, which kind of seems to be dominated this kind of politics, is kind of, the absence of a non-identitarian left, the absence of a left wing that's actually winning to take on this, this, this debate and, 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 and this argument. And in the absence of that, that left, what you get is this kind of polarisation between the identitarian, identitarian left and the libertarian right. And there's a huge number of people who are in the middle of that debate, including, I think, myself, who just don't want to get involved or, yeah. or are concerned. So I'd be interested to see your reflection on that uh, issue. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I didn't go too far into history, um, but you know, I, I, I think that 1968 was an incredible moment um, uh, against uh, the establishment. You know, I, I, I think it, it was the energy was incredible in terms of um, what was going on in the USA, in Paris, um, uh, in in, in the, some of the art colleges in in, Lon in London, for example, um, and. Um, uh, what I think is, you know, you have this paradox. There is a paradox going on in the left, uh, and um, and whether they're Marxists or anarchists or whatever, you know, um, you have in this uh, uh, this contradiction. And I, I'm a firm. I, I think a Hegelian, Hegelian approach of dialectics, thesis antithesis. We might find some kind of synthesis is a really important way to move forward, um, both historically, intellectually. Um, and um, what, what I think uh, Paris 68 was really interesting for was that it, it may have uh, it had some great degree of seriousness, but also it poked fun at so much things. It had a real sense of humor. Um, you know, satire was really strong. Um, some of it was a bit, you know, uh, uh, a bit too uh, navel gazing. Others, um, uh, other, other elements of it was very, um, I think, inspiring. I think there's a you know a lot of um, people on the traditional uh, conservative um, position will attack postmodernism, for example. Now I'm I'm not one of those people. I actually think postmodernism is a very interesting, broad um, term. It's you know sometimes hard to define, but it's about uh, a sense of plurality. There's a, you know pluralism is very much at the heart of postmodernism, in my opinion. Um, it's about questioning the meta-narrative, whether that is a high authority, um, and uh, it's about um, it's a kind of anti-essentialism. Um, so, for example, you know, I would say um, that the death of the author is a very good thing, where you just look at the text alone, for example, um, irrespective of what that person has said or done in his or her life. You know, and everyone's very quick to come down on everyone from Mahatma Gandhi, you know, and wanting his statue being pulled down, um, to uh, Martin Luther King was a bad guy too, you know. Uh, so just thinking, forget all that. Look at what they wrote, what they said, and the strategies they employed, um, which um, kind of gets me to a point where I think the left is kind of cannibalizing. It's starting to eat itself. And, uh, and, and, and there's never going to be popular support as a result. Um, it will, the Labour Party will probably never win an election for the next 10 years in, in the United Kingdom. Um, that's my opinion, uh, because they, are, uh, they have lost any sense of vision that will um, inspire ordinary working people. Um, so the class, where class analysis has been thrown out of uh, uh, socialist or Marxist thinking, is, is, is a big worry. Um, and um, what I think uh, it's the left is forgetting is the great tradition that it had of defending free speech, of fighting for free speech. Um, the, um, the, the various, you know, um, the, the, the moral right, you know, which was represented by someone like Mary Whitehouse in the 70s, um, uh, who was, you know, very, um, very much a sort of pro-religious um, uh, um, uh, individual, and um, what with how that has flipped over now, where we're seeing much more. Apart from, I said, you know, there are conservatives that will object to certain works of arts, like the Chapman Brothers' um, sculptures, um, but they are in a minority. What you see in a majority now are. Um, Theatres and galleries um, removing or shutting down or cancelling um, uh, productions um, because of um, someone's individual 
point of view on something. Um, so the left, I think, because it has abandoned that, that kind of critical debate and that it wants to exclude so many other voices from its uh, arena, um, leads to what Mark Fisher said. You know, I think um, uh, his, his writings are st very important, um, that it's, it's created the vampire's castle. Um, and the vampire, you know, it's, 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 it's this sort of blood-sucking kind of institution that's, you know, it's draining any kind of uh, uh, individual kind of thinking, um, any kind of uh, uh, work that might go against the grain of, um, of its body politic. Um, and, and I think the left has to take responsibility for that. And, and um, 1968 was a great moment, but it's full of contradictions. Uh, and we have to be eclectic. Uh, I th like I said, my politics is eclectic. Um, take the best from that, that period, not throw everything out, because there is, I think there's a worry uh, that the backlash will create this counterattack uh, against so-called cultural Marxism, for example, or, um, or postmodernism. And I think we can be much more eclectic and hybrid about our thinking that's not just left or right or libertarian. Uh, and find the good in everything, and what is for the common good. What allows uh, freedom in the best possible sense, uh, freedom of uh, artistic expression, freedom to experiment, that you can have work from centuries ago that you could still call beautiful and uh, sublime, but work that may have a complete counterposition to that. We might be living in a nihilistic age, and artists like Jake and Dios Chapman, I think, express a sort of nihilism um, that exists in our society. But should that be cancelled? I don't think so, or censored. So dialectics, I think, is the bottom line for me. One more question, or maybe some commentary. Um, so I'd like to uh, ask you a question uh, about the role of the social media in this phenomenon of cancel culture. Because, of course, the, the, the role of social media is, is uh, uh, important or uh, it's obvious, but my question is if it is um, the problem with social media or there are, are there, uh, uh, the source of this phenomenon of cancel culture or just a tool uh, which make possible to, uh, you know, to make this witch hunting on the greater, greater scale than the uh, traditional media. What, what do you think about it? Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of good in social media and um, there's a lot of problems with social media. It's, uh, 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 obviously, it's a platform that we are given access to. It's not our, you know, it's not this space that you have control over as, um, you know, as a curator. Um, and um, we spend too much time on it and I think what happens is that you start to create um, bubbles um, and you start to operate in echo chambers. Um, it, it's, it breaks down any kind of um, uh, communitarian, and I use that in the best sense of the word, uh, communitarian feeling that, um, uh, that we live in a very diverse community um, with um, a plurality of different thoughts and points of views and perspectives and political spectrums. Um, what social media do is it distills, so if you are a hard right or if you're a hard left, um, it starts to, the algorithms just start to put stuff out that you know, either angers you or antagonizes you. And so for example, my social media pages can be awash with stuff that I may sort of click, yes, I agree, I agree, I agree. And then um, uh, if there's something that you disagree with, you think, dare I say something because I will be under attack. And the um, the amplification of uh, voices on social media, where it's just so easy to retweet, click a like, or you don't have a dislike button, but um, uh, someone could just call you uh, out for being an alt-right or you know a fascist, or um, you know even on uh, on the other side, I've seen um, people on the right, you know, um, uh, 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 say derogatory comments about. Um, uh, uh, left-wing um, uh, uh, thinking or positions. 
and it, it gets distorted. I think, um, you know, there's this kind of, um, uh, it is a bit like Marshall McLuhan's, the, the medium is now the message, you know, because it just feels that um, you have to uh, engage with it, but also um, you feel quite, there's an isolation that goes on. You might feel this sort of feel-good factor when everyone likes your, what you've said and it's retweeted a thousand or five thousand times. Um, but does it contribute to real public debate uh, in the public, the real public space, public sphere, uh, and arenas? Um, you know, protests at the moment feels that it's just about trying to shut each other down, and um, and that's the the problem um, where I think. Um, social media is amplified, it's, it's almost circular, you know, it takes things from uh, maybe a minority, could be a hundred people protesting against Dave Chappelle, for example, um, which when you look at the videos, it's not tens of thousands standing outside Netflix wanting to burn Dave Chappelle down, it's, you know, 30 or 40 people, um, and, um, uh, but then that is amplified on social media, uh, then there's a letter to condemn this comedian. Then there's, you know, um, uh, news stories to condemn uh, this comedian. Um, and, you know, very sensible people will start to write uh, opinion pieces, which um, really has no kind of um, reasoned debate uh, uh, that goes on. So social media has become this um, echo chamber, I think, um, where you, we're only ending up speaking to each other rather than having um, that much wider plurality uh, of, of thought. Um, it's going to get worse, I think, um, with um, uh, Mark Zuckerberg's kind of empire of uh, uh, meta, as he's rebranded uh, his, his social media platforms. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it almost sounds postmodernist, you know, but it does talk about, you know, Meta for me is almost an overriding um, narrative that overrides other narratives, or that can control other narratives. And, um, uh, and we will see, I think, um, uh, more silencing under, um, under you know, uh, Facebook's um, um, community guidelines. Um, uh, a couple of times, uh, very innocent pieces where maybe it's um, uh, a painting of a nude gets suddenly taken down by social media and I complain about it, eventually it does go back up by thinking, should I complain about it or should I let it go? No, I can't let it go. You know, I cannot allow these um, tech giants to have control over our lives. And, um, uh, and I think um, the algorithms are, um, they, 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 they mine your data and they will start to almost make you consumer activists. Um, so you're, you consume the activism that you want to, uh, that kind of aligns with your, your point of view. And that is worrying um, because we do start to lose uh, any kind of um, uh, diversity or plurality of, of opinions. Um, so yeah, let's have more public conversations rather than having big arguments on Facebook. Um, I think, uh, or, or Twitter, I think it's, it is good for, um, uh, for finding out what's going on. Uh, I think uh, it has in the very early days of uh, the Arab Spring, when there was a lot of hope there, um, it was a very important um, tool uh, against authority. Um, sadly, the Arab Spring feels like uh, a disillusioned movement. Um, and, um, uh, you know, a lot of people that don't have a voice use social media. So I think it's an important platform still. Is good, right? Sorry, say that again. Don't you think it all started with first report abuse button on social media because it actually encourages people to report something, shows them reporting is good. Oh yeah, yeah. I think um, the, 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 when um, the reporting abuse, um, of course, you know, there's there's um, people can say something that is hateful. Without a doubt, there's some things I've seen which I think is makes me feel uncomfortable. Um, but I know that something I might have said makes other people feel uncomfortable. We have to 
uh, argue back. And as I said, sometimes I may have said something that's a bit throwaway, satirical, ridiculous, and someone's reported that it's an abusive comment. Um, and the, um, I think the point is to not to attack people. I mean, I had some sensible people that just said, come on, Manic, that's a ridiculous thing you said. And I'm thinking, well, you're ignoring what this ridiculous person said about someone else, you know, where that person is trying to um, uh, cancel um, you know, a particular academic, for example. Um, so it's, it's not about... I think people need to kind of get beyond um, the language and actually say... Okay, Manic, that was a bit over the top or a bit extreme what you said, but there is uh, an issue that needs to be debated more civilly and with more consideration. And I think um, that's something that I would agree on at the end of the day. Um, but um, that, that happens through um, conversation. If someone is angry or abusive, the, the last thing you should do is report to that person. The main thing you should do is, is, is kind of say, what makes you think that? Why did you say that? Um, what is your reason behind this? Um, rather than report abuse button is so... Um, it just disempowers everyone, I think. Um, and the trouble is that the social media giants um, uh, do have so much control over, um, uh, over um, conversations and debate. What initially was seen as very um, liberal, free-thinking kind of territories, um, there's a lot more um, worrying clamp down, I think, uh, on social media and, and a lot of um, partnership between politicians um, and uh, the, 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 the tech, the social media tech giants. So Nick Clegg, who was former leader of the Liberal Democrats, is now very high up in Facebook. Um, I think, I can't remember what his position is, but these kind of things where former politicians are now, you know, working for big tech giants is... Very interesting and worrying. So I think it was uh, the last question. <laughs> so thank you, uh, Manik. Thank you very much for this very interesting uh, lecture presentation and and for this discussion. And thank you all for the for the question for very interesting questions. Uh, yes. <laughs> thank, you, thank you very much, and I invite you to, to, to visit uh, Wiazowski Castle, not only the exhibition, but also uh, such interesting uh, meeting with very interesting person. Thank you very much. Thank you all, and uh, really appreciated your questions. I need some Polish beer now. <laughs>